Good evening. Um, I did have a question. Um, how should we treat our bodies? Are they the temple of God? <clears throat> well, the answer is yes. Our bodies are the temple of God. And we're going to cover this question tonight. So that was very apt this time. Tonight we want to look at the Elijah message. And uh, first we're going to go to Louis Pasteur. A little science takes you away from God, but more of it takes you to him. Well, this is not science as much as it is history tonight. But, <clears throat> well, no, I've got another question. I'm sorry. What if you have to take medications that contain stimulants? Is that still, quote-unquote, bad? Is it different because the doctor prescribes it versus consuming things with stimulants like caffeine? Um, one of the statements of belief in the Adventist church is, I believe that my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and will honor God by caring for it, avoiding that which is harmful, abstaining from the use of alcoholic beverages, tobacco, and the misuse of narcotics and other drugs. Notice I emphasized misuse, okay? Over 100 years ago, doctors were prescribing people who couldn't breathe well to smoke cigarettes. Can you imagine that? Well, we know better now, but back then they didn't. Uh, during that time period, Adventists were told that tobacco is an insidious poison. Today, we know it is. Some people are prescribed morphine to help break the addiction to heroin and other drugs, but morphine itself is an addictive drug. Today, they have legalized pot for medical and recreational purposes, but it, with the active ingredient THC, tetrahychloric acid or something like that, which is an acid, is a mind-altering drug. Mind-altering. The key is that the main healing factors in pot can be extracted without the use of THC. You don't have to get high in order to get well. Okay? If the doctor gives a prescription for pain or a condition, then that in itself is not misusing the drug. Misusing it is a sin and a crime and a big reason many people today are addicted to painkillers. That would be a misuse. You know, when I go to the drugstore and I get my DayQuil or my NyQuil, they have to have me show my driver's license. I said, why, you don't think I'm over 21? No, it's because they, they want to keep track of me to make sure that I'm not using these things, misusing them, uh, to get high. And I said, I don't think I would use a little pill with a little tiny bit of alcohol in it to get drunk. But that's the way the law goes right now. <clears throat> the Karnak steel is dated 1,209 uh, B.C. and gives us dates of the pharaohs in Egypt. Archaeologists found the Karnak steel, a stone monument, was writing on it. And the writing was in Egyptian. This find gives us clues to the existence of Moses in Egypt and the major players in the Red Sea scenario. Uh, in 1 Kings 6 1, we see the building of Solomon's temple in the month of Zib, 970 BC. 480 years earlier, we have the Exodus in 1450 BC. In 1530 BC, Moses was born. Who was Pharaoh then? Tutmos the first. He had no male heirs from his first wife, but he did have a daughter. And she married Tutmos the second, and he had no male heir by his first wife. His second wife, wife Iset, had a son, Tutmos the third. Tutmos the second wrote in the papyrus. Anastasi, one, I am without equipment, no bridges to build, no straw to make bricks. Well, that sounds funny because it agrees with what it said in the Bible. The Bible tells us Pharaoh tried to make the Israelites not only make bricks, but to gather the straw as well. When Tutmos II died, there were, according to Egyptian papyrus, two contenders for the throne. The second is not named. But Moses was the adopted son of Hatshepsut. But Moses refused the throne, remember? Since Tutmos III was too young, Hatshepsut 
ruled Egypt as co-ruler with their two young son at that time. When Thutmose III took over, Hatshepsut was erased from history. Her images were broken down and his rival was erased from Egyptian history as well. So he didn't like the idea that his mother was co-regent or co-ruler with him when he was young. Why? Because there was somebody else she wanted to put on the throne. And that was Moses. So when he got in charge, he got rid of her and Moses, as far as the history of them. At Shepsut was the one who found Moses in the water. She was the daughter of the Pharaoh. Tutmos the first. Tutmos III, also called Ramses II, elevated Amenhotep as co-regent. And this is a picture of Tutmos II. Alfred Edersheim proposes in his Old Testament Bible history that Tutmos II is best qualified to be the Pharaoh of Exodus based on the fact that he had a brief, prosperous reign and then a sudden collapse with no son by his first wife to succeed him. Upon Hatshepsut's death in 1458 B.C., Tutmos III at last got the throne to himself. Her groundbreaking reign remained a secret for hundreds of years. Before his own death, Tutmos III moved to erase Hatshepsut from the historical record by defacing her monuments and removing her name from the list of kings. And this is uh, a relief of Tutmos III. Thutmose III was the first uh, sixth king of Egypt's 18th dynasty, one of the greatest military leaders in antiquity and among the most effective and impressive monarchs in Egypt's history. Thutmose III was the son of Thutmose II and a lesser wife named Isaac. Thutmose II was married to Queen Hatshepsut, royal daughter of Thutmose I and a powerful woman, Let me go back. Who was God's wife of Ammon, or proposed to be? In other words, the son of a god, the daughter, the wife of a god. You know, all right. Thutmose the second only reigned two to three years. According to Exodus fourteen twenty three, he drowned in the Red Sea. That's why his reign was so short. His firstborn son died in the 10th plague, according to the Bible. When they found the tomb of Tutmos II, they discovered that the body was too young to be him. So they determined that it was his firstborn in the tomb who died in the plague. Tutmos II's body was never recovered because where was it? The middle of the Red Sea. And thus couldn't be buried in his tomb. Okay, just a little history lesson. Notice the Tutmos, Tutmos, M-O-S-E, the first, Tutmos, M-O-S-E, the second, Tutmos, the third, M-O-S-E, and Moses, M-O-S-E-S. -E and it fits right in with those kings, Tutmos, or Tutmos. All right, tonight we want to look at the Elijah message. Elijah was a nondescript man doing his daily duties when God called him to work for him. He comes out of nowhere. Where did, where did uh, Elijah come from? You know, just doing his daily work. Guy working in the factory. Guy working in his fields and plowing in the fields like Elisha. The guy, just a regular person, comes out of nowhere. And God called him to work for him. This is an example of what God can do through ordinary people who are willing to allow God to lead in their lives and follow where he leads them. Elijah is called by God to go to King Ahab, go to the king, go to the president, and rebuke him for the sins that he has caused Israel to commit. Tell him all. He tells him that there will be no rain these years except by his word. Because evidently, King Ahab refused to listen to him. Elijah came, comes out of nowhere. God always has men to whom he entrusts his message. His spirit moves on hearts and constrains them to speak. But the servant of God soon realizes that he has risked something. He finds himself in his message the subject of criticism. 
His manners, his life, his property are all inspected and commented on. His message is picked to pieces and rejected in the most unsanctified spirit. Many ministers and members, to avoid criticism and rejection, start to shape their messages to please people. Putting pillows under every arm, right? Make them feel good. And end up separating themselves from God and his message becomes tame and lifeless. In many churches you go to today, what you get is tame, vanilla sermons. So God sends Elijah to hide by the brook Cherith, where he could have fresh water during the famine. In 1 Kings 17, 6, we are told that ravens brought bread and meat in the morning and evening for his to eat. So God took care of him, right? We are told that God's people in a time of famine, their bread and water will be sure. God's not going to let you starve. He's going to take care of you. But eventually, the brook dries up. God sends Elijah to Zarephath, to a widow woman, who, to feed him. She tells him that all she has is a little meal and oil for her and her son to eat before they die of starvation. He tells her to give him a little cake first anyway. They say, we barely got enough to eat ourselves. We're going to eat it, and then we're just, we're out of food. We're going to die. And he said, well, give me a little for it first. Okay. This was a test of her faith. He tells her the barrel of meal will not waste nor they all fail until it rains on the earth. And they ate for many days. God took care of that woman because she took care of Elijah. The famine affected everyone, including this widow woman and her son. Thousands around her were starving to death and they found no relief. Remember the Psalm 91? A thousand shall fall at your right hand, and ten thousand at your left hand, but it shall not come nigh unto thy dwelling. Thousands of people dying around you, and God is still looking after you. But he's not looking after those people. Well, they didn't give their lives to Jesus. They don't have the faith to get them through. He provided for the widow woman and her son by sending Elijah to her to provide for her. God could have sustained her by himself, but he usually uses his people and sends them to help those in need. Amen? Are you ready for the Lord to use you to help somebody in need? But soon her son fell sick and died. She thought her son had died because of her sins. However diligent and devoted we may be in the service of the Lord, suffering and affliction, disappointment and bereavement may still be our lot. That doesn't mean God has left us. But Elijah laid on her son three times and prayed. God heard Elijah's prayers and restored her son. This miracle was to turn her towards the God of heaven instead of the God of forces and the God of nature, which many in Israel had now turned to. You see, many people don't say they're Christians anymore. They say they're spiritual people. What does that mean? Well, I believe in the God of nature. In 1 Kings 18.1, the Lord told Elijah to show himself to King Ahab and God would send rain upon the earth. So Elijah went to Obadiah and told him to go tell Ahab that Elijah was here. You know, Obadiah wrote a book in the Bible, right? Okay. But Obadiah was afraid that Elijah would disappear and Ahab would have to kill Obadiah. Obadiah didn't want to die. So he said, why do you want to send me over there to have him kill me? Because you're just going to disappear. Obadiah said to Elijah, Was it not told my Lord what I did when Jezebel threw the prophets of the Lord, how I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water? And you say, Go tell Ahab, Elijah is here, and he shall slay me. 1 Kings. And it came to pass that when Ahab saw Elijah, he said, Are you he that troubles Israel? Are you the one causing the problems in Israel? You're the one that Stop the rain from coming. And Elijah says, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and you have followed Balaam, or Baal, the God of the sun. Those who refuse to receive reproof and to be corrected will manifest hatred against the instrument God has sent to tell them that they're the cause of the trouble. 
They will spare no means to cast a stigma upon the one who brings to them the message God has given. <clears throat> so then Elijah says, Now send and gather all Israel into Mount Carmel. And the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400. So you got one man against 400 or 850 people. The truth is not always popular, is it? So Ahab sent on, unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets unto Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel, once a place of scenic beauty with its idol temples, was now a place of desolation. Trees stood gaunt and bare, springs were dry, and flowers were no more. The, the, the famine, no rain, had destroyed it. The gods of fertility had sadly failed their worshipers. Their own shrines were places of vexation and dishonor. Elijah proposed to demonstrate the utter folly of the worship of Baal. Elijah said, how long halt you between two opinions? If Baal be God, worship him. If the sun God is God, worship him. If the Lord be God, worship him. Worship the creator. When? On the Sabbath day. The people were given the opportunity to express themselves. But 1 Kings 18, 21 states, the people answered him, not a word. What could they say? They were starving to death. They didn't have any rain. You see, when people turn away from God, they become confused and blind to their own condition in relation to God and really don't know what to think or do. In 1 Kings 18.30, it states that Elijah repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. How many altars do we have that are broken down and need to be repaired? The altar of worship, the altar of family, the altar of prayer, the altar of sacrifice. In verse 33 and 34, it states that Elijah said, Fill four barrels of water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice in the wood. Then he said, Go, do it a second time. And then he said, Do it a third time. Well, somebody said, Well, where did you get the water? Well, from the ocean. Salt water. Can't drink that. Just make you more thirsty. Not only did he trust God to send fire, but he was certain God would do it in an extraordinary fashion to show that it was no trick or accident that God answered his call. God does not always answer our prayers the first time we call upon him. I know you've experienced that. You pray and you expect God to answer it right now. And it doesn't happen, right? Elijah humbled himself until he was in a condition where he would not take the glory to himself. This is the condition upon which the Lord hears prayers, for then we shall give the praise to him. What did the fire represent to Elijah and to the people? The presence and approval of God. When Moses was in the desert and the burning bush was there, he was told to take off his sandals. Why? Because God was present. He was there. The cloven tongues of fire on Pentecost was to prove that God was with them. God is a consuming fire. So Elijah had the 450 priests of Baal killed. The Bible says he slew them there. And the other 400 of the groves as well. I don't know if this means Elijah killed everyone personally. 850 is a lot of people. Or that he ordered them killed and thus was responsible for their deaths. Do you realize how long it would take to kill 450 people or 850 people? But there was one person Elijah did not kill, though he was an evil king of Israel, and that was King Ahab. Elijah said to Ahab, eat and drink and get up, for there's the sound of abundant rain. It wasn't raining yet, but Elijah trusted God. And when that small black cloud was seen in the distance, he says, okay, God's answered my prayer. The rain is coming. As Ahab ate and drank, Elijah went out and prayed seven times, and Elijah's servant saw a small black cloud the seventh time like a man's hand. Elijah ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel as it poured rain. Now, why would Elijah kill all these prophets of Jezebel, Ahab's wife? And Ahab's an evil king, and yet he does not kill the king. He runs before him to protect him on the way back home. Isn't that amazing how much God's love is? When Ahab got back, he told Jezebel what had happened at Mount Carmel and how Elijah had her, all her paid clergy killed. 
Jezebel sent a message to Elijah. I will make your life as the life of one of my prophets by tomorrow about this time. In other words, she's saying, you're going to die by tomorrow. Now, Elijah had just faced down 850 prophets of Baal and the groves. He had seen God work a miracle with fire licking up not only the water and the stones and everything there, right? But when she said that to him, he took off running. He got scared. He went a day's journey into the wilderness and slept under a juniper tree. It says, Elijah wishes himself dead. This is a reaction of an overstrained feeling. It's well to remember that no one can live on a mountaintop all the time. The path of life goes into the valley with hardships and disappointments. This is an unavoidable fact of life. And when you go up, you know you're going to come down. Religious revival, when the soul gives way to discouragements and depressions induced by the traits of everyday life, it is well to remember that no one can live on the mountaintop all the time. The pain of life descends into the valley where hardships and disappointments are the unavoidable fact of life. It is easy to be happy and courageous when we're on top of the world, but it's not really so easy when our spirits are low and all the world seems determined to bring us down. It is then that we need most to keep hold on God that we may not give way to doubt and despair. When down, look up and climb the heights again. Amen? While in the cave, the word of the Lord came to him and asked him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Why did you run away? Elijah had not done the right thing by fleeing from Jezebel. One of the apparent tragedies of life is that those who do the most in the cause of righteousness are those who suffer the most. Even though Elijah had made a mistake, God did not cast him off, but sought to restore his confidence so that he would again carry on his valiant work for the Lord. Elijah instinctively covered his face before the presence of the Lord. His ruffled spirit was calmed, his impatience subdued. The high, strung, impetuous prophet became meek and submissive, ready to listen to the voice of the Lord. It is not always the one who creates the greatest commotion or noise who accomplishes the most for the Lord. Because God revealed himself at the cave to Elijah. God speaks to Elijah. What are you doing here? God reveals himself to Elijah through the wind, the earthquake, and the fire. And then he reveals his tremendous capacity to connect with us in a still, small voice. And Elijah prayed to die. I've been faithful. I'm the only one left. And I'm ready to die. God says, you're not the only one left. There's 7,000 that have not bowed their knee to Baal in Israel. And then the angel baked a cake on coals and woke Elijah and said, go ahead and eat it, Elijah. We're not going to kill you. you still got work to do. You're not done yet. And then the angel did it a second time. Here, you need some more food. This is a long journey. And Elijah went 40 days and nights on that food. Could you go 40 days and nights on one meal or two meals in one day? Oof. Isn't it nice to know that we are never alone? God's angels are there to protect us, provide companionship for us, and feed us as well. God has many ways to take care of his people in times of hardship and trouble. You know, St. Patrick, St. Patrick's Day in Ireland was a Sabbath keeper. And he had a companion. And I can't remember his name. Polonius or Polonius or something like that. And uh, he said he spent his Sabbath afternoons talking with him about the Bible and God. And he felt like that was an angel in human form that it helped support him in his efforts to revive and restore uh, 
when I say Ireland, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. When Jesus came to the earth, the disciples asked where Elijah was, since he was to come first according to Malachi 4. Malachi 4 is a really short chapter. It's the last one in the Old Testament, actually, I think. Isn't it? Yeah. It says, For behold, the day comes that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that comes shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And you shall tread down, tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the days that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Well, this is obviously the end of time, right? But then look at verse 4. Remember you the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Remember my law. How sad that so many people have forgotten it. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So Jesus said he's the Messiah. They thought that when the Messiah would come, he would destroy everything. He would set up his throne on the earth. And they said, well, if you're the Messiah, where's Elijah? Elijah's got to come first. So you know what Jesus said? John the Baptist. Matthew 11, 11 through 14. Jesus said, John the Baptist, that's Elijah. Matthew 17, 10 through 13. Jesus says, John the Baptist, that's Elijah. But when they asked John if he was Elijah, what did he say? John 1, 19 and 20. And this is the record of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you that prophet? And he said, No. Now we got a problem. Jesus had just told the disciples that John the Baptist was Elijah. And when they asked John if he was Elijah, he said what? No. But then you go down. Who are you then? Verse 23. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Elijah. In other words, I've got the same message. I'm not the same person. I'm not a reincarnation. I'm not Elijah come back down from heaven. I have the same message. Get ready because the Messiah is here. Before Jesus comes a second time, Elijah is to come and prepare people to be ready for God's second coming. That's the third Elijah. That's the one just before the destruction of the earth. We saw in Matthew, I mean, uh, in Micah, Malachi, chapter 4. We are the Elijah people of the last days to present the three angels' messages to the world. We may be called to face kings, judges, religious leaders who have broken the commandments of God. We may be asked to face our relatives, neighbors, and friends to patiently, humbly call them to repentance and to the present truth and following Christ as our Savior and Lord in all things. Whom shall I send, God's call is. Can we say, here am I, send me, to be an ambassador for Christ and represent him properly in our words and our actions and in our lives? The first angel has the everlasting gospel, Revelation 14, 6. Then I saw another angel. An angel is a messenger with a message, and this is the message, the Elijah message. Flying in the midst of heaven, that's everywhere, all over the earth, having the everlasting gospel. It's the same gospel that the disciples preached to preach to them which dwell on the earth, and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, tribe, kindred, everywhere, to everybody. It has to be a worldwide church. It can't be a little local church in one little corner of the earth. 
it has to be spreading the gospel everywhere they're not doing their job. The message is, number one, to fear God. Number two, give glory to Him. For the hour of His judgment has come. Has come. It's begun. 1844. And worship the Creator. Worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of waters. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Because Jesus made everything and rested the seventh day and blessed it and made it holy. In Genesis 3, 6, we see that mankind was defeated in three ways. Eve at the garden, in the Garden of Eden, physically, she saw the tree was good for food. Two, mentally, it was a tree to make one wise. And spiritually, the tree was pleasant to the eye. An eye is a symbol of spiritual discernment. But in Matthew 4, 1 through 10, we see Jesus win the victory in three ways against the same enemy, physically, mentally, and spiritually. <clears throat> when Jesus was tempted to turn stones into bread, that's physical, right? You're hungry? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So he defeated the devil there. Eve fell, Jesus won. Well, why don't you just throw yourself down off the top of this mountain because the Bible says, and he quotes scripture, you shall not cast your, he will not allow you to dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus says, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. So Jesus gained the victory mentally over the devil's lies where Eve fell. And spiritually, he's, Jesus, uh, the devil said, well, why don't you just bow down and worship me and I'll give you all these kingdoms. Jesus says you should worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. So Jesus got the victory mentally, physically, and spiritually where Eve had fallen. So he won that victory for us. Amen? You see, God brought forth the children of Israel out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, so that they might be able to keep his laws. And he brought forth his people with joy and his chosen with gladness that they might observe his statutes and keep his laws. Psalm 105, 43 through 45. You see, God doesn't ask you to obey him first. He saves you first. Then he asks you to obey him. Does that make sense? You don't obey to be saved, but when you're saved, you obey. God led the children of Israel out of Egypt so they could obey him. They weren't even keeping the Sabbath anymore because they had to work seven days a week. And what did they need? They needed rest, but they needed a spiritual rest. They needed a relationship with Jesus Christ, with God. <clears throat> But God not only wanted to forgive our sins, he wants to give us victory over our sins. You think that's true? He gained the victory for us in the desert and on the cross, but he wants to gain the victory in us to save us from our sins. Matthew 1 says you should call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. It doesn't say in their sins, it says from them. 2 Peter 2.19 2 Peter 2.19. While they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought into bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than in, in the beginning. And then it talks about the dog going back to his vomit and the pig to its mire. In other words, God wants us to give us the victory. He doesn't want us to continue in sin. John 8, 34 through 36 John 8, 32 through 36. <clears throat> and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you what? Free. Not under bondage. Not a slave in Egypt. 
He freed them from the slave, that slavery in Egypt, didn't he? And then he gave them the law. And then 36, if the Son therefore make you free, you are free indeed, right? Free from what? There's verse 34, Jesus answers, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever commits sin is the servant of what? Sin. Well, I've been a slave to alcohol all my life. I've been a slave to smoking all my life. I've been a slave to this all my life. You know what? God can give you the freedom not to be a slave. But you don't accept Jesus Christ and say, I want to go back in slavery. That doesn't make any sense, does it? John 15, 10. John 15, 10. Oh, I thought I knew that one. That's not the same verse. John 15, 10. If you could keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have come at my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And then let's take a look at Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. And this is kind of interesting because a lot of people don't preach on this. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So you know, a lot of people put a period after Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We can do whatever we want to. No, that's not what it says. It says, who walk after, not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and then it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own spirit in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for um, sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. The righteousness of the law might be filled, fulfilled where? In us. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now let me emphasize this. Verse 7 and verse 8. Because the carnal mind is enmity or opposed to God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Doesn't want to keep the law of God and can't. That's the carnal mind. So they that are in this flesh cannot please God. Jesus says you got to be born again. First birth wasn't good enough. John 1, 29, Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. 1 Corinthians 15, 3, Christ died for us according to the Scriptures. Galatians 1, 4, Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. Here we see that Jesus died for us that we could be justified freely by his grace, but we are also to deliver us from this present evil world. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, yet I live, yet not I, but Christ lives where? In me. Romans 4.25, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our what? Justification. 1 Peter 2.21, for even hereunto were you called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. What did Jesus do while on the earth? Lived according to his Father's law in love and mercy, and kindness. We are saved by grace. It's a free gift, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not in of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto what? Good works. He still wants us to work. Person says, I'm saved, I'm not going to work. What are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> Ephesians 2, 9 and 10. Ephesians 2, 9 and 10. No, I just read it. But grace leads us to obedience and good works of righteousness. For the law of God that leads us is not carnal, but spiritual law that unborn again people cannot keep. That's Romans 8, 7. The law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin, Romans 7, 14. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So they that are in the flesh cannot please God. That's why Jesus said you got to be born again. 
Matthew 5, 21 through 28. You shall not kill. Whosoever, and Jesus said, whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. That's the spiritual nature of the law. You should not commit adultery. Whosoever looks upon a woman with lust in his heart has committed adultery with her already in his heart. Spiritual nature. It's in the mind. And Jesus says, You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, if they slap you on the right cheek, give them your left cheek. That's the spiritual nature of the law. The first angel's message says to fear God. Remember, this is the everlasting gospel, right? For the hour of his judgment is come. This doesn't mean to be afraid of God because Revelation 21.8 says, The fearful shall be cast into the lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone. So if you're afraid, you're going to get burned up. Whenever Jesus showed up, he said, Don't be what? Afraid. What do you have to fear if you're doing whatever God wants you to do? The only time you need to be afraid is when you ain't doing what God wants you to do. Amen? Fearing God is an awesome respect, which leads to obedience as shown in these verses. Awesome respect. When you were a little child, you were afraid of your father. That doesn't mean that, you know, you're afraid he's going to beat you to death. You had an awesome respect for him. Daddy, I want to be just like him. I want to go wherever he goes. When he comes home, he says, Daddy, Daddy, come on home. Now, some of you had some abusive parents, and I'm sorry. But I'm trying to use this as an example of a good father, Okay. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, a good understanding, have all they did, what? Do his commandments. Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 8, 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, arrogancy, and the evil way, and the froward mouth do I hate. So fearing God, according to these passages, is showing an awesome respect for God and his law. Solomon, the wisest man in the world, states at the end of his book, Ecclesiastes, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or evil. So fearing God has to do with a mental restoration in us. Philippians 4, 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report, virtue, praise, think on these things. Secondly, the first angel states, Give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. How do we glorify God? 1 Corinthians 6, 19 states, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Giving glory to God has to do with a physical victory in us. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, whom you have from God and you are not your own. Your bodies don't belong to you. They belong to God. We were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. There's that glorify God, right? Glorify him. Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, so whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do it all for what? Glory of God. There's glorify Him. How? In your bodies, what you eat and drink, what you say, how you live. So we're to glorify God or give glory to Him in what we eat, drink, do, and say, and how we live. Daniel 1, 8, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he would not defile himself. And how did he do that? Daniel 1, 12. Let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. And at the end of the 10-day uh, test, it says that Daniel and his fellows were wiser, 10 times wiser. Why? The Leviticus tells us of unclean food. The swine, though it divides the hoof, having cloven hooves, yet does not chew the cud, is unclean to you. Pig is 90% fat and is a garbage collector that God put on the earth to clean up the slop. You squeeze a pig's toes and what comes out? Garbage. Deuteronomy 14.9 talks of the unclean and clean animals in the water. These you may eat of all that are in the waters. You may eat all that have fins and scales. 
If they don't have fins and scales, you don't eat them. It's unclean to you. It's a garbage collector. These things are called an abomination four times in one verse. All Leviticus 11, 9 through 12. All that have not fins and scales in the seas and in the rivers, they shall be an abomination unto you. They shall even be an abomination unto you. You shall not eat of their flesh, but you shall have their carcasses in abomination. Whatsoever has not fins and scales in the waters, that shall be an abomination unto you. Do you think that God's trying to get a point across? Genesis 1, 29. The original diet for man and for animals, actually, and God says, see, I've given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for fruit, food, vegetables, fruits, and nuts. In Genesis 7, 2, we see two of each unclean animal and seven of the clean animals go into the ark. It's not all two by two. The clean ones were by sevens. Because when God flooded the earth, when the flood waters receded, how much stuff was going to be on the ground to eat? How much stuff was going to be on the trees to eat? Nothing. They had to give them something to eat. Isaiah 66, 15 through 17 tells us that many will be slain. For behold, the Lord will come with fire, and the slain of the Lord shall be many. Those who sanctify themselves, these are people who think that they know more than the Lord does, and purify themselves to go to the gardens after an idol in the midst, eating swine's flesh. And the abomination, we, what was that abomination again? Seafood without fins and scales. And the mouse Ugh. shall be consumed together, says the Lord. Who said that? I didn't say that. God said that. Acts 15, 19 through 21. Wherefore, my sentence is, is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollution of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. For Moses of old time is that every city, them that preach him being read in the synagogue every Sabbath. In other words, one of the apostles is saying, don't trouble the Gentiles, but we write to them not to eat things offered to idols. Don't eat things strangled. And don't eat blood. And you know, one of the big transferences of disease comes from blood. And stay away from fornication, sexual immorality, right? Acts 15, 28 and 29 says, And it seemed good to the Holy Ghost. Who? Holy Ghost, and to us to lay upon you no greater burdens than these necessary things. These are necessary things. This is to the Gentiles, that you abstain from meat offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which if you keep yourselves, you should do well. And remember, he'd already said that Moses is read every Sabbath in the churches to know the other essential things. Leviticus 3.17 says, this shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations and all your dwellings. What does perpetual mean? All the time. You shall neither eat fat nor blood. Why not blood? For it's the life of the soul or the being. And fat was burned on the altar to God, and it's not fit for human consumption. Isaiah 65, 2 through 6 says this. I have spread out my hands all the day unto what kind of people? rebellious people, which walked in a way that was not good after their own thoughts of people that provoked me to anger continually to my face, which eat swine's flesh and broth of abominable things. There it is again, clam chowder, oyster stew, is in their vessels, which say, stand by yourself, and not near to me, for I am holier than you. Hmm. These are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burns all day long. Romans 16, 18 states this. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own what? Belly. And by good works and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Philippians 3, 19 states, People will be destroyed because they have, not, they have made God their belly, and whose glory, remember that word, give glory to Him, in what? In your bodies, which is your reasonable service, is in their shame. Because they don't take care of their bodies and they eat whatever they want to. And they become like the pigs that just eat anything and everything that comes along. Who set their minds on earthly things. 
Glorifying God also has to do with how we use our bodies, not only in eating and drinking, but in interactions with others. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 states, fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Whew. Anybody left yet? But then he adds in the next verse, and such as some were you, but you are justified, sanctified, and cleansed. But does that mean you're sanctified and justified and cleansed to go ahead and keep doing that stuff? No. Third aspect of the first angel's message is what have to do, and that is, of course, physical. The spiritual aspect of gaining victory in us. Worship the one who created all things. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of waters. Isaiah 56, 1 through 7 says, Thus saith the Lord, keep your judgment and do justice, for my salvation is near to come, and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man that does this, and the son of man that holds on it, that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord to be his servants. Everyone that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it and takes hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. There's a blessing for those who keep the Sabbath. Isaiah 58, 12 through 15. And they that shall be of you shall build the old waste places. Remember, Elijah Rebuilt the altar. Right? You shall rise up the foundation of many generations, and you shall be called the repair of the breach, not breath, breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. So his Elijah people, and remember, it says, God says, remember the Sabbath day, because he knew so many would forget. But as Elijah people would call people back to the standards to be a repair of the breach in the wall, restore a past to dwell in. The Ten Commandments are a wall of protection around each believer. But if one commandment is broken, the wall is open for the enemy to come in and raid the house. Where has the wall been broken for so long? Isaiah 58, 12 through 15. If you turn your foot from the Sabbath from doing your pleasure on my holy day, whose holy day is it? It's God. Can you pick and choose which one you go to? Oh. My holy day, God's holy day, and shall call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. Then you should delight yourself in the Lord. Hebrews 4, 4 through 9 in the New Testament. And he spoke in a certain place on the seventh day on this wide, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest... Seeing, therefore, it remains that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached did not enter in because of what? Unbelief. Again, he limited a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, I know some translations say Joshua. It's the same word, Yeshua. You know, it could be Jesus or Joshua. I think it's Jesus. If Jesus had given them rest, then would he not after it have spoken of another day? Jesus didn't talk about another day. Jesus rested in the tomb from the work of redemption as God rested in, the to uh, God rested in from the seventh day on the creation. There remains, therefore, a rest to the people of God. Now, the word for rest all through the book of Hebrews is one word. But when it talks about rest right here in Hebrews 4.9, it's talking about sabbatismos. And that's a literal keeping of the Sabbath. There remains, therefore, a literal keeping of the Sabbath to the people of God. And then he goes on and says, Let us labor to enter into that rest, lest we fall after the same manner of unbelief. This is the third part of the first angel's message, and it's a call to spiritual restoration in us. So man fell in the garden in three ways, mentally, physically, and spiritually. Jesus came and gained the victory for us mentally, physically, and spiritually. The first angel's message, the Elijah message, to prepare us to be ready to meet the Lord is to restore the victory in us mentally, physically, and spiritually. This message was to be given because judgment has begun in heaven and Jesus will soon return. Can you see people getting angry with this message? You're doing church all along. 
You're worshiping like Cain and not like Abel. You're doing it your own way instead of God's way. And somebody needs to straighten you out. Not because he wants to destroy you, because he loves you and he wants to save you. And he sent people to tell you about it. And if you refuse to listen, what else can he do? 3 John 1, 2 states, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. God wants us to be healthy, wise, and spiritually discerning. Amen? He wants us to be strong mentally, physically, and spiritually. The second angel's message is just as unpopular as the first angel's message is. Babylon has fallen. Babylon is the mother church. The woman of Revelation 17, the call is to come out. Just as Elijah called people to repentance and away from Baal worship, just as John the Baptist called people to repentance and wash away their sins, so the Adventists are calling people to allow God to be Lord and Master of their lives and prepare them for His coming during the judgment. The third angel's message is don't worship the beast in his image. Don't receive his mark. This is the last warning message to planet Earth. Just like Elijah was rejected by the people and they wanted to kill him, and John the Baptist had his head cut off by the king. Ahab sent soldiers to kill Elijah, and he called fire down and killed him twice. The third time, the leader of the soldiers was more careful with Elijah. John the Baptist was rejected, and they did kill him by beheading him. So the Seventh-day Adventist Church will present the everlasting gospel of the three messages to the world. Most of the world will reject the message. Some will want to kill the messengers because they don't like the message or want to live or follow it. The question is like Elijah. If Baal be God, follow him. If the Lord be God, follow him. How long halt you between two opinions? Who do you want to follow? The wide and easy gate that leads to destruction or the straight and narrow way that leads to life? If you want to be ready for Jesus to come, would you please stand up? I know I do. If you know that God is calling you to be baptized or rebaptized or to dedicate or rededicate your life to Him and washing your sins away, I want you to come forward and join me up front. We're going to have a baptism soon, and we want you to be a part of it. Let the Spirit speak to your hearts. Those who have already come forward, well, you can come back forward again. It's okay. One time I had a call in the Philippines and 100 people came forward. After we prayed, I sent them back to their seats. And I mean, the skies were thunder and lightning and it looked like it was going to rain on us completely. Right, Marcella? Because the Lord, the, the devil was angry because we were having a call. But I felt compelled. And I know I've heard this story before and some guys might be telling the truth, some guys aren't. But I felt compelled to have another altar call. I had already sent those 100 people back. So if there was going to be anybody else come back up, it's going to be all by themselves. And I had another call. And as I prayed, and I looked up, one lady is standing in front of me. She was a school teacher, and she'd come to the meetings to learn about the health message so that she could work with her kids in the school. And so I went down to talk to her and pray to her with her, and she ran back to her seat. So I followed her back to her seat, and I said, um, what's the matter? You know, and she says, well, I don't want to be baptized tomorrow. Now, this was on a Friday night, and we were going to have that baptism the next day. I said, well, you don't have to be baptized tomorrow. When do you want to be baptized? On my birthday. I said, that's fine. You just made the commitment. You know, you don't have to be baptized tomorrow, you know. And so we had a nice conversation, and I didn't get see her get baptized, but I'm hoping that she went through and followed through with it and got baptized. But God can work on people's heart, and sometimes they misunderstand the message too. So um, let's pray again right now. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your love and mercy and kindness in Jesus Christ. Thank you for giving us this Elijah message, your Lord, and receiving this message, this everlasting gospel. And thank you for people that can see it and hear it and understand it and want to be a part of your church family. And we pray that you will bless them through your Holy Spirit as you pour upon them the grace of the Father.
If you got any questions, please write them down, leave them in the question box in the table in the foyer. I will try to answer them tomorrow night. And those on, uh, online watching can email me at mfracker at charter.net. If you're watching online and if you're impressed and touched, pardon? Friday night, yeah, not tomorrow night, Friday night. If you're impressed and touched by the Holy Spirit that you want to learn more, you might not be ready for baptism, you not, might be ready to join the church yet, but you want to learn more, you want Bible studies, you want to learn more about what the church teaches. I've tried to cover as much as I could in these meetings, but sometimes there's things that get left out, and we want to cover it all. Uh, but the you know, Bible does say, teach, baptize, and continue to teach. So you don't need to know everything in order to get baptized, but you know the basics we want to make sure you know before you take that step. And if you want to be baptized or if you want to join the church, you please uh, email me or let me know somehow on Facebook or YouTube or wherever it happens to be you're watching. Um, God bless you. And Friday night, we're going to talk about the future of the earth. You don't want to miss it. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will guide you and lead you and keep you safe for the holy angels as you go home. And we'll see you Friday night. Amen. <laughs>